Hi everyone. Before I start, I just wanted to acknowledge that the Dalhousie Student Union and Dalhousie University is located on unceded, unsurrendered Mi'kmaq territory. And we are all treaty people. When you look at this image I have up, what do you see? I see shapes, I see curves, I see different ways, different stresses, different points that are going against a grain, that are going against a current. This is my name. My name is Masuma Asad Khan, and it means innocent lion warrior. This is me. When people think of me, they do not think of this stage. They do not see me as an innocent child. They often see me vilified, painted as a terrorist, painted as an angry Muslim woman who doesn't know how to speak eloquently, who doesn't really know what she's doing, who isn't the one that should be here at the Dalhousie Student Union, but I am. This is my family. This is my mother, my sister on this side, and my brother. These people are the reason I am still here today. My mother taught us as children that you always stand up for what's right, no matter what it costs. You have to be able to put everything on the line for your community. That means your life. That means how people perceive you. That means your job. That means your career. That means everything for your community. I was raised by a single Afghan mother who is a teacher who has multiple degrees, did her master's in education while being a single parent, working multiple jobs, putting us all through school, and still cooking me biryani every Friday. <laughs> I was raised by a resilient woman who only showed me through every step of the way just how much she could go against the current. So how is it I couldn't be the same? My siblings, again, they raised me while my mother was working. My brother was the first one to hold me as a child. My sister, my brother used to make her change my diapers because he didn't want to deal with it. And I know she's in the crowd right now, so shout out, Sama, I love you. These people have shaped me and have held me in the most hardest moments of my life, when everything felt like it was coming down, and today it still feels that way. I can't say that I would be the woman I am today without my siblings. My mother always said this, is that when I'm gone, all you're gonna have left is your brother and your sister, and you always have to make sure that you are there for them, just like your community. So being raised by a woman like this, being raised in her shadow of resilience and resistance, as she was an activist, as she used to take me, I was a little activist baby. You know those cute ones you see with the signs? Yeah, she used to take me around with her, she, I remember, she was protesting against uh, the war in Iraq. And there I was, hiding behind my mother, wondering how she could speak to so many different people in such a large crowd and not be afraid. Because I used to be terrified with public speaking. But now, I guess her resilience just came through genetically. So it's with this woman this woman that has held me through everything. And a lot of people have asked me, Masuma, how have you survived all the violence that you have gone through? And it's only the violence that folks have seen. There has been violence in my life that you don't know about. But how have I survived it? It's this woman, it's my family, and it's my community. And those are my values. So having a mother who's so resilient and, and, and leads resistance, it propelled me into thinking the way that I do, into showing up when I'm asked to show up, 
That means showing up and taking names and being there when someone calls you, no matter what time of day it is, no matter what time of night, no matter how cold it is, even if it's your birthday, you show up. I've held events like this when I was introduced with the frustration that I have of being an Afghan woman, a Muslim woman, a racialized woman, and a woman with an invisible disability, I found myself being the one that's had to educate folks on my experience. When you see this and you look, you can't tell whose face that is. You don't know if that person identifies as male, female, non-binary, trans, queer. What are they? You can't tell. I've also done events like this, World Hijab Day. Because folks, when they see me, they automatically think, oh, she must be an oppressed woman. And then when they hear me speak, oh, well, you know, I thought all Muslim women were oppressed. And if you're not oppressed, there must be something wrong with you. That's how they think. That's how they see me. When they see a strong, independent Muslim woman, they don't see me for the work that I've done, for the work I've done in the community, for my experience or anything. They just see me based off a piece of cloth, right? They don't see me for anything else. They don't see me as that child. I've led thousands of students through the streets with our elders and drummers leading us showing true solidarity and fighting tuition fees because they suck. <laughs> and education should be accessible for everyone. Yeah, it's a pretty rad picture. It was a lot of work and I find myself in moments after this, people are always like, Masuma, don't you experience burnout? When I do things like this, I'm actually, after this moment, I couldn't sleep for two days. I had so much energy, I was literally bouncing around in the wellness room that's downstairs because I didn't know what to do with it. I, that's what happens to me when I organize. That's literally, I was bouncing. I couldn't stop, I couldn't stop laughing. I had so much adrenaline. It's really weird, but it happens. And when people see me, they don't see that. They don't see a Muslim woman that can't stop laughing. They don't see a Muslim woman that is putting her heart and soul into work. They see what the media portrays me as, or what people comment me as, or what people want to say I am, but I know who I am. The Women's March. Challenging the narrative of white feminism and the fact that the Women's March did not include me. I had to make space for my identity I spoke at the first uh, Women's March here in Halifax, and I basically called out the entire event because I felt that's what I needed to do. Because folks weren't talking about how this event was transphobic, how this event was not created or even in collaboration with any Muslim or racialized women who are part of the uh, planning committee. We were a second afterthought. We were just, okay, we're gonna have a space for a Muslim woman to speak. When they contacted me, they said, we're looking for a Muslim woman. Of course, it's me. There's no others, right? Eventually, I found myself in a position where I could actively advocate for students. And it was through this position that I was elected and through this position that I faced a lot of violence. And it's the position I currently still hold. And a lot of people don't like seeing my name on that door, but it's there, just like I am today. I took part in a campaign um, with uh, artwork from an amazing indigenous person. Their name's Raven Davis. Um, and it was called Unlearn 150 the attempt to start talking about decolonizing education and what that could possibly look like. But the campaign didn't really get too far. It was soon after 
I actively spoke about how I was against this whitewashing of Canada's history, as I too come from a colonial um, background where my people were colonized and my people have gone through wars of century. And what they're going through right now is what I consider modern day colonialism. The war, the apartheid that's happening in Afghanistan that people don't really talk about. This is how people see me. Now think back to that image of me as a child. They don't want to see me that way. They want to see me with the red smoke. They want to see me as someone that's going to intimidate them, as someone who's going to scare them. But the most scary thing for them is that I've still survived against this current. They didn't want me to survive. It often feels like I'm encaged by this this cage I can't see. It's like I'm surrounded by violence everywhere as I go. This, this picture is exactly how I feel every day. There's a barrier that's on me that I can't pinpoint, that I can't actively deconstruct when I can do all these other things, when I can help folks and show my work through solidarity and action and be a true accomplice but I feel this way every day. They see me behind green screens as I was on the coast, trying to talk about why I did what I did, why I said what I said, why I am the way I am. But it didn't stop things from this happening. This is what violence looks like. And it's not physical violence. It's not a violence that someone can say, hey, I saw that, right? All you snake, snake, snake Muslims can kiss my white snake, snake, snake. This is our country, not yours. I already feel alienated as a human being. And there's thousands of these messages. You folks need to remember, there's a point and still is a point right now where there's hundreds of thousands of people who don't want me here. And that's hard to reconcile with as a human being, as someone's child, as someone's sister, as someone's daughter, cousin, partner, whatever I am, as, as someone's friend. This, all of this is what you get. All of this, this is my experience. I was also shown solidarity, which I'm very appreciative of. It helped me survive against this current. But there's also moments that we become our own current, where we become the resistance we have to face. I found myself pushing people I love out of my life because I didn't trust anyone. I didn't feel that anyone loved me or could love me or that I was worthy of anyone's love. And that's something I still struggle with today. I'm on white supremacist websites. And that's me. That's how I feel, trying to figure out where to put this number six with my eyes closed, trying to feel my way through. And this is a picture of me showing my mom how great I am at doing this with my eyes closed. But it didn't feel great, because when I was going through all this violence, it felt like my eyes were closed. It still feels like my eyes are closed, and I can't tell where that six is fitting in. I don't know, I can't feel it. Nothing feels the same. Nothing tastes the same. Nothing looks the same. Nothing is the same. I'm not the same. But even through all that violence, I kept going. And I will keep going. Through events like this, with Al Jones, God lover. With women like this, Jade Peak, 
one of my best friends, a black African Nova Scotian Mi'kmaq woman who's trans. God love her for holding me through all that violence and being there for me and showing me what community is and what community care can look like. That I'm not alone through this violence. That even though our violence looks different, we can hold each other in that space. Still doing work like this, even though they don't want me here. And holding on because my sister wouldn't let me let go. At this moment, I had taken part in a project called um, The Sisters Project, showcasing different Muslim women and how they look. Muslim women of every kind. It's amazing, you should check it out. But in this moment, the amount of darkness that I was feeling is unreal. It looks like I'm resilient. It looks like I'm resistant. It looks like I'm going against the current in my bright red jacket but I'm feeling broken. I feel broken. Not because people are telling me I am, I feel it. But still persevering, taking that red smoke and giving it a whole new meaning, right? <laughs> and showing up because my community needs me. I've only survived through everything I have with my community, with my mother, with my family, with my sister, with my brother. But in all this, there's something that I definitely recognized about myself. With all the violence I have dealt with, I had to have a conversation with myself and it kind of went like this. Masuma, people don't want you to live for the work that you're doing. People want you dead. And I said to myself, I would rather die than not address injustice, than not speak the truth, than have to apologize for telling you how I feel when I deal with white supremacy and racism. I will not, I will die. If that's how the creator wants to take me, I'm okay with that. But I'm not going to live the rest of my life on this stolen land without actively deconstructing all the violence that encompasses it. Thank you so much.